This is the second teaching in the Way of the Master video series. It's called True and False Conversion. If you've ever wondered why so many people in the church act like people in the world, this may help you understand. Please don't let anything distract you as you take the time to examine yourself. Your eternal destiny may depend on it. On March 14, 1982, a young man stumbled from the local pub where he had been drinking and partying with his friends for several hours. Fumbling for his keys, he managed to then start the vehicle and proceed down the road. Laying on the horn and swaying dangerously from side to side, he careened down the small town streets doing 120 miles an hour. Amazingly, the town couldn't prosecute him because, officially, it had no laws on the book regarding speeding while drunk. In response to the incident, the town eventually passed strict legislation setting the maximum speed at 60 miles per hour. Only a matter of weeks later, the same young man repeated his offense. This time, the long arm of the law was able to reach him. He was not only arrested, but the law enabled the town to prosecute, convict, and levy a $10,000 fine against his irresponsible actions. A fine that the young man could not pay. But in the end, it was not the law that prevented the boy from speeding again. Because as he sat in jail, his father stood before him. You're free to go. I paid your fine. The loving father had sold the few meager possessions he owned and mortgaged his home simply to be able to pay the debt that would free his son. So while it was the law that initially stopped the boy from reckless speeding and creating his unpayable debt, in the end, it was not the law that kept the boy from repeating his actions. It was the love of his father having paid the debt for him that changed his heart and changed his behavior, which now only wanted to please his dad. That is the picture of the response that automatically follows in the heart of a genuine Christian when the law convicts him, and the father pays his debt with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and he is driven to a place of humble gratitude for all that God has done for him. The law serves its purpose initially, but in the end, it is not the threat of the penalty of the law that keeps a true Christian from repeating his sinful actions. It is the love of his heavenly Father, having paid the debt for him, that changes his heart, changes his behavior, and makes him only want to please his dad. Look at Romans 7 verse 4 again. Wherefore, my brethren, you are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. The law had no dominion over that speedster whatsoever. It was satisfied by the sacrifice of the Father, the payment of the Father. And so we are dead to the law by the body of Christ. That was the sacrifice of the Father. The law holds no demand upon the Christian. We're free from its condemnation. D.L. Moody said the law can only chase a man to Calvary no further. Wherefore, my brethren, you become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should bring forth fruit unto God. We should be married to another and bring forth fruit unto God. We bring forth the fruit of a new lifestyle, a lifestyle that's pleasing in the sight of God one that is lawful. We don't commit adultery, we don't lie, we don't steal, we don't lust. Why? Because the law has demands on us? No, no. The Bible says love is the fulfilling of the law. We love God and we want to please Him, therefore we're not lawless. And the Bible tells us that if we love God, we'll bring forth fruit to Him. What does the Bible mean by fruit? Well, there's fruit of repentance. Like Zacchaeus, 
who said, Lord, if I've wronged anyone, I'll pay him back. Fourfold, he knew the law. We'll bring forth the fruit of thanksgiving. Got a thankful heart because we've seen the cross, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of good works. The Bible speaks of the fruit of good works. John Wesley said, do all the good you can to all the people you can at any time you can, as long as you ever can. Through the Spirit, we will have love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, and temperance if the Spirit of God dwells within us and the fruit of righteousness. In fact, the Bible says, every tree that brings not forth good fruit will be cut down and cast into the fire. Let's recap what fruit will grow in a true Christian's life. Number one, repentance. A 180 degree turn away from sinful behavior and towards godly behavior. Number two, thankfulness. A thankful heart that is grateful for what God has done and shows itself in a cheerful disposition. Number three, good works. A life that becomes others-centered helping the aged, feeding the poor, teaching children, etc. Not self-centered, all free time consumed with personal hobbies and interests. Number four, fruit of the Spirit. An ever-growing capacity of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and self-control in the life of the believer. Number five, fruit of righteousness. Doing the right thing according to the way God defines it in His Word not according to the way man defines it in his own mind. So as witnesses of Christ, we don't want to just get decisions for Christ. We don't want to get people joining our youth group or our church group. What we want is to see fruit-bearing Christians, ones who show their say by the fruit that is manifest. Now with those few thoughts in mind by way of reduction, let's now look at Mark 4, verse 3, at the parable of the sower. This is what it says. Mark 4, verse 3. Hark and behold, there went out a sower to sow. It came to pass, as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And the other fell on good ground, and yielded fruit, and sprang up and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, some a hundredfold. And then Jesus said, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And in verse 13, the disciples didn't really know what Jesus was saying. And they said something that caused Jesus to say this to 